Good morning, and welcome to this lecture on mediation. First, let me define the concept of mediation. There are several roles that could be played by a third variable. If you think back to basic statistics, you may have learned about relationships between two variables, but things change a little bit when we bring a third variable into the picture. Such a third variable can play a role as a moderator, a confounder, or a mediator. So, imagine that we have predictor x and outcome y, and we introduce a third variable z. If that third variable z plays a role as a moderator, then we say that z affects the relationship between x and y. And this is the topic of next week. A third variable can also be a confounder. For example, when the third variable z causes both x and y, thereby causing x and y to appear related or changing the relationship between x and y, then we can call z a confounder. For example, the body mass index, BMI, is a confounder of the relationship between bone mineral density and mortality. So body mass index influences both the bone mineral density and people's mortality. And bone mineral density also has a unique relationship with mortality, but that relationship becomes influenced by the role of BMI. The concept of a confounder is closely related to that of a spurious association. A spurious association occurs when x only appears to be associated with y, and that apparent relationship can have two causes. One is because there is a confounder z, which causes both x and y, thereby making it seem as though x and y are correlated. And the second reason is because of pure coincidence. Sometimes variables appear to be correlated by means of pure coincidence. Now, last week we discussed the example of the number of ice cream sold and the number of burglaries. This is a clear example of a confounded relationship because the season or the temperature on a given day leads people to buy more ice creams because it's warm and is also associated with people going on holidays and empty homes are very attractive to burglars. So in this case, the association between ice cream sales and number of burglaries is probably spurious due to a confounder. But there's a whole website about spurious correlations that are due to pure coincidence. Uh, for example, here there is a graph of the number of people who drown by falling into a pool and the number of films Nicolas Cage appeared in. And uh, these two are quite strongly correlated with a correlation of 0.67. So by all means, so if we interpret this relationship causally, we should stop Nicolas Cage from ever appearing in another film again. But probably this correlation is spurious due to pure coincidence. Now today I want to talk about the role of a third variable as a mediator. And a mediator means that it help, helps explain the relationship between two other variables. You can think of a mediator as a process variable. For example, if we have an effect of x on y, then in this diagram z partially explains the relationship between x and y. So x has an effect on y because x leads to z and z leads to y. So we can think of a mediation model as kind of a process model. For example, if we educate people about a healthy diet, then they might increase their fruit and vegetable consumption, which in turn leads to an improvement in health. So here, the change in fruit and veg consumption is the process by which X leads to a change in Y. So this is a box diagram of a mediation model. We see that X predicts Y, and Y has a residual prediction error epsilon. And X also predicts M, which has a residual prediction error U. And M also leads to Y. And we can have an effect directly from X to Y and an indirect effect through the mediator M from X to Y. So let's discuss the terminology of mediation analysis a little bit. And the first term that I want to introduce to you is the total effect. The total effect is simply the bivariate linear regression between X and Y. We're calling it a total effect now because we're going to introduce different kinds of effects that you haven't heard about before. We can represent this box diagram as a formula for a regression equation, where we can say that individual values on the variable y, y sub i, are equal to some intercept i sub 1. Note that we're using different letters in these examples than in previous weeks, but the letters are really trivial. So there's an intercept plus an effect a for the variable x plus residual prediction error epsilon. So 
the total effect of x on y is known as A. So now let's look at the complete mediation model. In this mediation model, we have two dependent variables, the mediator m and the eventual outcome y. We can define the regression equation for m as follows. The individual values on the variable m are predicted by an intercept, i sub 2, plus an effect of x with a slope equal to b, plus individual prediction errors. And we can define the regression equation of y as a multiple regression, which has an intercept i sub 3. Note that this is different from the intercept of the bivariate regression, because now we include multiple predictors, so its value is going to change plus an effect of x, which is now accented, so we say a accent times x, plus an effect of the mediator, which we'll call c, c times m, plus again prediction error epsilon sub 3. So if we fill in the coefficients of the regression equations into the path diagram, then we see that the effect of x on m is labeled b, the effect of m on y is labeled c, and the effect of x on y is labeled A accent. Note that I have accented this let letter A because the coefficient will have a different value as compared to the bivariate linear regression. Now when we seek to understand how we can investigate mediation, it is worthwhile to have a little history lesson. And this is because the way you will see people write about mediation is very heavily influenced by Barron and Kenny, who describe a stepwise approach to investigating mediation. I refer to this as the old school approach of investigating mediation, but it's very important that you know how this is done, what the rationale behind it is, and also what its shortcomings are and why we nowadays address mediation using structural equation modeling. So Barron and Kenny introduced a stepwise approach that can be easily done in SPSS or any other statistical software. These are the steps. Step one is to check whether x is a significant predictor of y. This is the path A. If this is a significant predictor, then we move on to step two, where we check if x is a significant predictor of the mediator m. This is path B. If, again, the answer is yes, then we analyze a model with both m and x as predictors of y, and then we check whether m is a significant predictor of y, and we check what happens to the significance of the coefficient a accent. We look whether a decreased or maybe even increased, and based on that we draw conclusions about whether there is mediation. So here are the steps as path diagrams. Step one is to examine whether path a is significant. Then step two is to examine whether path b is significant. Step three is to examine whether path C is significant, and step four is to examine what happens to path A after we control for the effect of the mediator. So when we look at the Baron and Kenny steps, it is important to note that we can analyze these steps using just the techniques of bivariate and multiple linear regression. No structural equation modeling needed. We can just run several regression analyses and piece them together to get the mediation path model. The first analysis that we run is a bivariate linear regression between y and x. That is indicated here as formula 1. y sub i is a function of some intercept plus the effect of x, which we label a, plus individual prediction error. The second regression is the effect of x on m. So individual values on m are a function of some intercept plus the effect b of variable x plus, again, individual prediction error. And the final regression that we run is the multiple regression where we predict y from both x and the mediator m. So if we've run all of these regression analyses, then we can calculate what is known as the indirect effect. And the indirect effect is the effect that goes from x to y through the mediator m. In other words, this is the part of the effect of x on y that is explained by m. And there are different ways to calculate this quantity. One way is to take the effect of x on m, which we labeled b, and we take the effect of m on y, which we labeled c, and we multiply b with c. b times c gives us the value of the indirect effect. Now I also already explained to you that the effect a from the first regression equation in this, uh, in this slide 
is the total effect of x on y, and the effect a accent is the direct effect of x on y after controlling for the mediator. From this, we can conclude that a different way to calculate the indirect effect will be to take the difference between the total effect A and the direct effect A accent. The difference between these two also gives us the value of the indirect effect. And therefore, the difference between A and A accent must be the same as B times C. In other words, if we subtract the indirect effect from the total effect, we get the direct effect. So let's look at this with a path diagram. We can say that in this diagram, the effect of x on y is perhaps partially mediated by the process variable m, or we can say that x has an indirect effect on y through m. The direct effect of x on y in this diagram is represented by a accented. The indirect effect of x on y is equal to b times c. And the total effect of x on y is equal to a accent plus b times c. Now, let me introduce you to the syntax in Lavan that allows us to define these parameters. You see here main model and some syntax for the defined parameters. The main model uses syntax that you're already familiar with. We use the tilde to define a regression equation. But one thing is, has been added. Specifically, we now label the regression coefficients. And that label we can later use to define new parameters. So the top line of syntax here says that y is predicted by x plus m. And then we use a times x to indicate to Lavan that we want to label the regression coefficient for x with the letter a. Then we say plus c times m. And this tells Lavan that we want to label the regression coefficient of the mediator m with the letter c. So we have an effect of x, which is called a, and we have an effect of m, which is called c. Then we define the regression equation for the mediator, and the mediator is predicted only by x, and we label its effect with the letter b. Now comes some new syntax, and here we have the colon equals operator. Um, we use the colon equal operator to define a new parameter. So here you can see that I want to define a parameter known as ind, short for indirect effect. And I say ind colon equals b times c. So I can refer back to the labeled regression coefficients from the main model. Then I say tot, which stands for total effect, is defined as a plus the indirect effect. So I can also use the labels assigned to other defined parameters to define more downstream parameters. So here I first define ind as b times c, and then I define total as a plus ind. So this is going to give me the indirect effect and the total effect of x on y. Now I introduced the Baron and Kenny steps before, and I also told you that these are part of statistical history, and that is because there are some problems with the Baron and Kenny steps. One key problem is that Baron and Kenny use statistical significance as the criterion by which they progress through the different steps. But statistical significance is not designed to be used for model selection or to change our analysis decisions. The second problem is that underlying the steps is this belief that there must be a total effect to be mediated. So Baron and Kenny first look whether there is an effect of x on y, and if there isn't, they're done with the steps, they only do step one. This is a problem because there might be what we call a suppression effect, a suppression effect occurs when the direct effect and the indirect effect are opposite in sign and therefore at least partially cancel each other out. If there is a suppression effect, it could happen that step one would be not significant, even though the direct effect and the indirect effect could both be significant. And the final problem is that when we compare the Baron and Kenny steps to other methods that are available to test for indirect effects, we find that Baron and Kenny has the lowest power of all available methods. So I'll introduce some better tools to you later. Let me first get into that concept of suppressing mediation a little bit more though. Suppression occurs when the direct and the indirect effects are of opposing signs and therefore partially cancel each other out. For example, 
you might expect that intelligence predicts the number of errors that people make on a test for this course. But let's say we collect data on students' intelligence and the number of errors they make on the course and we find no significant relationship. Interesting, it's not in line with theory. But let's say that we collected data on a third variable, boredom. Then we might find that if we investigate a mediation model, actually people who are more intelligent make less errors on the test, so there's a negative effect of intelligence on the number of errors. But more intelligent people also become more bored while making the test, and boredom predicts making more errors on the test. So there is a positive indirect effect from intelligence through boredom onto errors. Because this indirect effect is positive and the direct effect is negative, in balance the two might partially cancel each other out and we find no significant effect. In such a case, including the mediator in the model actually helps us increase the predictive ability of x on y. So I promised you that I would tell you about new methods for investigating mediation, and it probably won't come as a surprise to you that we use structural equation modeling for this. Structural equation modeling has several advantages. First, it is easier. We can just run one model to investigate the whole mediation model. We don't have to go through all of the steps and analyze different regression equations. We can investigate two nested models, but I will get into more detail about that later. Secondly, we can compute the direct, the indirect, and the total effects as defined parameters. We can get standardized estimates for these defined parameters, and we can get standard errors for these defined parameters. We can get p-values, everything. And structural equation model allows us to easily investigate more complicated mediation models. For example, what if you have multiple mediators of one predictor? So several processes explaining the effect of x on y. What if you have multiple predictors and they all have an effect on one mediator, which in turn influences the outcome? Or what if you have multiple outcome variables? Or what if you want to introduce latent variables with a measurement model into your mediation model? For example, here is a model which has parallel multiple mediation. We have a predictor x, x has an effect on y, and that effect is partially explained by mediator 1 and partially explained by mediator 2. So using the same labeling conventions, we can say, well, the direct effect of x on y is A accented. Then we have an effect of x on the first mediator, which we label B sub 1, and an effect of the first mediator onto y, which we label C sub 1. And we have, have an effect of x on the second mediator, which we label b sub 2, and an effect of the second mediator onto the outcome, which we label c sub 2. Now we can use the same path multiplication procedure to get specific indirect effects for the effect that goes through the first mediator and through the second mediator. To get the first specific indirect effect, we can multiply b1 with c1. To get the second specific indirect effect, we can multiply the effect B2 with C2. If we want to know the total indirect effect, we can add B1 times C1 plus B2 times C2. That gives us the total indirect effect of X on Y. Now the direct effect, as I already mentioned, is A accented. And if we want to know the total effect that X has on Y, both directly and through the two indirect paths, then we can add A accented plus B1 times C1 plus B2 times C2. That gives us the total effect. So here's another example. We could have a sequential mediation model where X leads to the first mediator, which leads to the second mediator, which leads to Y. And there can also be several direct effects. So X leads to the second mediator directly, which leads to y, and x leads to y directly. Now, in the literature on mediation, you will encounter the term fully mediated. And fully mediated means that first we observe an effect of x on y, and after accounting for the indirect effect, that direct effect becomes non-significant. Looking back to the Baron and Kenny steps, it is no surprise that they determine whether something is fully mediated 
by looking at whether A accented becomes non-significant after accounting for the effect of the mediator. But there's a different way to test whether an effect is fully mediated. And to do this, I need to introduce the concept of nested model comparisons in structural equation modeling. On this slide, you see an example of two nested models. And the model on the right is nested in the model on the left. What do I mean by this? Well, the definition of a nested model is a model that can be created by constraining one or more parameters in another model to be equal to zero or equal to each other. So if I start with model one on the left, I could constrain the effect of x on y to be equal to zero. That effectively removes the path from the model, which gives me model two. The only difference between model one and model two is that the path A accented has been constrained to be equal to zero. This means that model two is nested within model one. Models like this can be compared statistically in a structural equation modeling context. So one more time, the definition of a nested model is that by constraining some parameters in model one, we get a second model, model two, and we can constrain parameters to be equal to zero or to be equal to each other. We can compare such nested models with a chi-square difference test or delta chi-square test. To understand this delta chi-square test, it's useful to remember from a previous lecture that both of these models have a model-implied covariance matrix, which we can call sigma hat, and these are compared to the observed covariance matrix in the data, which we can call S. Now, delta chi-square is based on a comparison of the distance between the sample covariance matrix S and the model-implied covariance matrix for model 1, with the distance between the sample covariance matrix and the model applied covariance matrix from model two. When making a nested model comparison, it is useful to remember Occam's razor. And Occam's razor told us that all other things being equal, we should have a preference for simpler models. Also remember that complex models have a greater flexibility to fit the data. And the most complex model is a model that has an equal number of parameters to the number of observed data points and this model will perfectly fit the data. It exactly represents the data. Our task as statisticians is to balance the necessary complexity with elegant simplicity. So we want the simplest possible model that still adequately represents the data. Now in this specific example, model two has one parameter less than model one. And the question we seek to answer is whether this simplification makes the fit significantly worse or not. If the fit is significantly worse, that means that model two is not supported by the data. So here is a flowchart for our decision process. First, the delta chi-square test looks whether the distance between the sample covariance matrix and the model implied covariance matrix is larger for model two than for model one. A larger distance will be translated to a greater chi-square difference value. If the chi-square difference value becomes very large, then we obtain a significant result for the chi-square difference test. And the conclusion associated with that will be that model 2 fits significantly worse than model 1, and therefore we have a preference for model 1. If instead we obtain a non-significant result, that means that model 2 fits approximately equally well, but it has the advantage of being simpler, and therefore, by Occam's razor, we would choose model two. Now let's look at a few applied mediation examples, and for this I just took images from published papers. Here is a path diagram for a paper that investigated aggression in adolescence. We have two dependent variables, overt aggression and relational aggression. The research question is whether marital conflicts, or conflict between the parents, has an effect on adolescence overt and relational aggression. And the authors hypothesized that such an effect would be partially mediated by positive and negative emotional reciprocity. So what we see here is a direct effect from marital conflict onto overt aggression with a value of 0.20. We don't see a direct effect of marital conflict onto relational aggression. And we do see several indirect effects. 
For example, there is one that goes from marital conflict to positive emotional reciprocity with a value of minus 0.22, and then an effect from positive emotional reciprocity to overt aggression with a value of negative 0.25. Now, these paths are both about minus one quarter, about minus 0.25. To get the indirect effect through neg positive emotional reciprocity, we can simply multi multiply these two. So we get a quarter of a quarter is about 1 16th. Note that because this path is negative and this path is also negative, when you multiply a negative with a negative, you get a positive value. So the indirect effect of marital conflict on overt aggression is positive 1 16th. And we can apply the same logic by tracing all of the paths. So for example, the specific indirect effect through negative emotional reciprocity is 0.26 times 0.28 is about a third of a third, is one ninth. And the indirect effect of marital conflict through negative emotional reciprocity onto relational aggression is again about 0.25 times 0.25, so it's about a quarter times a quarter, is one eighth. Note something interesting. The authors have omitted the direct effect from marital conflict to relational aggression, and they've also omitted the direct effect from positive emotional reciprocity to relational aggression. They probably removed these paths from the model because they were non-significant, which reminds us of the Baron and Kenny steps. And note that, as I've explained before, if you change your analysis approach after seeing the result, so, for example, you see that there are some non-significant effects and then you decide to remove them. This makes your analysis at least partially exploratory. A theory-driven analysis tests all of the hypothetically... A theory-driven analysis tests all of the paths that are of theoretical interest and then interprets their values. But if we start with such a theoretical model and then decide to remove some paths because they are non-significant, we are making our analysis exploratory. My recommendation would be to just test the theoretical model. So here's another example of a published mediation analysis. Note that this must be a structural equation model because it includes a measurement model for socializing and a measurement model for cannabis use disorders. Socializing has three indicators, whether people go out, whether they go to the pub or bar, and whether they go to a nightclub. And cannabis use disorders has two indicators, whether they abuse cannabis and whether they are addicted to cannabis. The process model says that socializing leads to tobacco and alcohol use, which in turn lead to cannabis use. And cannabis use leads to cannabis use disorders. We can see model fit indices for this model with a CFI of 0.99, which is very close to the ideal value of 1, so we have a really good fit according to CFI, and we have an RMSEA of 0 0.046, which is quite low, and it is below the acceptable threshold of 0 0.05, and it's below the threshold of good fit of 0 0.05. So by both CFI and RMSEA, we have a very good fitting model. But I have some questions about the theoretical argument behind this model. Does it make sense that socializing causes tobacco use and alcohol use and that tobacco and alcohol use in turn cause cannabis use? I'm not so sure. Thinking back to the different relationships that we can hypothesize between multiple variables, there's also a case to be made for a potential confounding relationship. For example, perhaps a genetic disposition towards addiction causes people to use more alcohol and tobacco and cannabis. So in this case, there could be a third variable that explains all three of those. Alternatively, we could say, well, perhaps if people have um, depression, they self-medicate with alcohol, tobacco and cannabis. Or if people experience negative life events, they tend to self-medicate more with these different drugs. So perhaps this causal model, which is based on kind of a gateway drug theory, Perhaps it is misspecified. And even if the fit is really good, we cannot conclude from this model that the theory is correct. If the model fit is very poor, that means that the data do not support the theory. 
But if the model fit is good, it does not tell us that the theory is true. It only tells us that there is no evidence against the theory. But a third variable could explain the data equally well. In this case, the model fit is also probably quite good because the model is nearly satisfied. The only thing that is missing that would give us a saturated model is direct effects from tobacco use and alcohol use and socializing onto cannabis use disorders. So now you know what an indirect or mediated effect is. Let me discuss how to test the indirect effect for significance. And for that it is useful to remind you of how we test a parameter estimate in general. Testing is based on the central limit theorem. And the central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution for many parameters in statistical models is approximately normal. And what is the sampling distribution exactly? Well, the sampling distribution is the theoretical distribution that we would get if we would take many samples, let's say a thousand samples, from the same population, which with each sample having the same size, and then we would estimate the parameter of interest, we could call it theta, in each of those 1000 samples. Obviously, some of the estimates of theta are going to be quite large, and some estimates of theta are going to be quite small, and most estimates of theta are going to have values around the average, and the average would be the true population value of theta. This hypothetical distribution of different statistics from different samples from the same population is called the sampling distribution. And usually we only have a theoretical sampling distribution. We don't actually go out and collect 1000 samples to estimate the same parameter in each of them. Now the logic behind testing is to do the following. We draw one sample, we estimate the parameter in the sample, so if the population value is called theta, then we can call the parameter t. Then we estimate a standard error for the parameter, which we can call the se of t, standard error for t. And we can derive, we can approximate the sampling distribution under the null hypothesis. That means if we assume for a moment that the population value is equal to zero, then there will be a sampling distribution with a standard deviation equal to the standard error of t. We look where the observed parameter estimate falls within the sampling distribution, and we calculate the tail probability, so the probability of observing a value even larger than t, if the null hypothesis were true. In other words, we draw a normal distribution with a mean around the value of zero and a standard deviation equal to the standard error of t. The tail probability tells us how likely it is to obtain a value for t at least as extreme as we observed in our data if the null hypothesis were true. Now this logic for significance testing of a parameter estimate applies when the sampling distribution is indeed normal. So, that means that if we had a population under the null hypothesis, so the null hypothesis is true, and the population value of theta is equal to zero, then we could draw maybe 10,000 samples of each n cases large. In each of those samples, we could estimate theta, and then we should observe a distribution something like this. On the left, we see what the sampling distribution would look like if we drew 100 samples from the population in which the true value of theta is equal to zero. It already looks a little bit like a normal distribution. In the middle, we see the sampling distribution if we drew a thousand samples. And on the right, we see the sampling distribution if we draw 10,000 samples. So this is what would happen if we actually drew a 10,000 samples from a population in which the value of theta is equal to zero. Now, if we have one sample, in which we observe a value of t equal to 1, then we can look in this distribution and calculate the tail probability of obtaining the value equal to 1 or greater. Now I already told you that when we do a significance test, we draw a normal distribution with a mean around the null hypothesis value, usually that is equal to 0, and a standard deviation equal to the standard error of the parameter. Now the standard error is the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, 
but in practice, if we have only one sample, we don't know what the standard deviation of the sampling distribution is. Therefore, we estimate the standard deviation of the sampling distribution, and that estimate is called the standard error. So the standard error is an estimate of the standard deviation of the sampling distribution. Therefore, it can be used to compute a z-statistic under the null hypothesis. The calculation is as follows. The z-statistic is equal to our estimate of theta divided by the standard error of theta. And we can use this to perform a significance test. We just look up the p-value for the corresponding z-value in a table, or we use r to calculate it exactly. Alternatively, you can, can use the same logic to compute a 95% confidence interval around the parameter estimate. Remember that a confidence interval is a window around a point estimate, and we can say with 95% probability that this confidence interval contains the population value. So that confidence interval is calculated by taking our point estimate, theta hat, and adding and subtracting 1.96 times the standard error of theta. Why 1.96? Well, because that is a z value that corresponds to a 95% interval. So that is a recap of the logic behind significance testing, and it assumes that the sampling distribution for the parameter is approximately normal. If this is the case, then we can use a z-test to calculate significance. There is a test for the significance of an indirect effect that is called the Sobel test, and the Sobel test uses a z-test for the indirect effect. Therefore, it makes the assumption that the sampling distribution of the indirect effect is also normal. So that the product of coefficients b times c has a normal sampling distribution. There's a problem with this assumption, namely that it is rarely true. If we look at the indirect effect b times c, that is the product of two parameters with normally distributed sampling distributions. The problem is that the product of two normal distributions is not always a normal distribution itself. If you look at the picture here below, you can see several diagrams that represent the product of two normal distributions, and you can see that they are often very peaked and very skewed. So if we represent the sampling distribution as a normal distribution, but in reality it is very peaked and skewed, then we get biased p-values. So the p-value may be either too small or too large. In either case, it is not accurate. So Sobel test is based on an assumption of normality, but usually with a product of coefficients, that assumption is violated. There is a better solution, and in this course we use that exclusively, and I highly recommend that you use it as well. And the solution is the bootstrapping algorithm. The term bootstrapping comes from the story of the Baron von Münchhausen, who pulled himself out of the swamp from his bootstraps. Here's a picture that illustrates the story. I think that the artist doesn't know where the bootstraps are located, because I imagine that they're not at the back of the neck, but probably on the boot itself. But anyway, it's a nice picture and a nice story. The logic behind bootstrapping is that in an ideal world, we could draw a thousand samples from the population and observe what the true sampling distribution is for every parameter in our model. In reality, we can usually not draw a thousand samples from the population because it is too difficult and too expensive. So we do the next best thing, and the next best thing is to draw 1,000 samples from the data. And we draw samples with replacement, which means that some people are drawn from the original data several times, and some people are not drawn at all. So we draw 1,000 unique resamples of the data. Then we estimate our model on each of the 1,000 bootstrap samples. This gives us a distribution of all of the parameters in our model across the thousand bootstrap samples. And that distribution looks like a sampling distribution. And we can actually treat it as if it were a sampling distribution. So we can say that we've empirically derived the sampling distribution. So here is a diagram explaining the basics of bootstrapping. Notice how similar it looks to the diagram that explained the basics of the sampling distribution, except instead of starting with a population, we start with our observed sample of n cases. From that observed sample, we draw 
a thousand or even more samples of n cases with replacement, which means that each sample may contain several cases multiple times and other cases not at all. In each of these samples, we can estimate our model, including the estimate of the indirect effect. So we get 1000 different estimates of the indirect effect. Some of them are a little bit small, some of them are a little bit big, and on average, they are close to the true value of the indirect effect. So 1000 bootstraps gives us 1000 estimates of every parameter, including the indirect effect. If we take the mean of those 1000 estimates, that gives us our bootstrap parameter estimate. And if we take the standard deviation of those 1000 estimates, that gives us the bootstrap standard error of the parameter. We can also cut off the tails of the bootstrap distribution and take the 0 0.025 and 0.975 quantiles of these 1000 estimates, and that gives us a non-parametric 95% confidence interval. Here is a diagram of the bootstrap estimates of an indirect effect. You see that it is indeed peaked and skewed on the left. We can get the 95% confidence interval by cutting off the bottom 2.5% and the top 2.5% and the red lines give us the window of that confidence interval. We can also calculate standard deviation of this distribution which gives us a bootstrap standard error. Now we already see that the confidence includes the value of 0, so that means that we cannot conclude that our estimate differs significantly from 0. In other words, there is no significant indirect effect. Now in this week's practical session, you will be estimating models with multiple indirect effects yourself based on the self-esteem data. So here you have a model where parental attitudes and peer attitudes predict self-esteem and those effects are partially mediated by empathy, prosocial behavior and aggression. If we define this model and we put the model description in an object called mediation model, then we can estimate it using the Lavan function SEM. And to bootstrap that model, you have to say standard error equals bootstrap. And you can say, I want 10,000 bootstrap samples. In general, I would recommend that while you are learning about these techniques, you use a smaller number of bootstrap samples because bootstrapping can take a very long time. It's a very computationally intensive technique. Because instead of estimating your model one time, as you've been doing up until now, you will estimate your model 10,000 times. So that's gonna take your computer quite a while. If you want to write a paper, however, then it is important that your bootstrap standard errors are as accurate as possible. So you want to include 10,000 or even 50,000 bootstrap samples. So let's run this analysis with bootstrap standard errors. So we add the argument SE equals bootstrap and bootstrap equals 10,000 for 10,000 samples. If we then ask for a summary of the fit model, then we can get all of the output, including a table for the defined parameters. And I use the syntax to define these parameters. And I use the syntax that I explained earlier to define these parameters. So you see that I labeled all of my indirect effects as ind, and then I used the abbreviations for the variables that constitute the mediational path. So for example, there's an ind par amp gg, which stands for the indirect effect of parental attitudes through empathy and through aggression. Now this effect has an estimate of minus 0 0.004 and a bootstrap standard error of 0 0.006. Now we already see that the absolute value of the estimate is smaller than the absolute value of the standard error, so it's not going to be significant. And indeed the z-value is minus 0.8, and the p-value is 0.43, so it's not significant. The indirect effect of peer attitudes through empathy and prosocial behavior, however, is significant. We see that the estimate is 0.05, which is more than two times the absolute standard error of 0.02. In fact, it is 2.4 times the standard error, that is the z-value, and that corresponds to a p-value of 0.02. So this indirect effect is significant. You also see that I defined total effects. So I defined a total effect for parenting and a total effect for peers. And the total effect for parenting is significant, whereas the total effect for peers is not. 
So actually, we see a suppression effect happening here. The total effect for peers is not significant, but the indirect ef effect for peers through empathy and prosocial behavior, that is significant. So it is useful to know about suppression effects and how to detect them. To get the bootstrapped confidence intervals, you need to use the function parameter estimates. You can call it on your fit model, and then you can ask for a boot.ci.type equals to bca.simple, and this gives you the simple bootstrapped confidence intervals. So here you see the bootstrapped confidence intervals for two of my indirect effects. We see that the lower bound of the confidence interval for the first indirect effect is negative 0.02, and the upper bound is positive 0.004. This confidence interval includes zero, so this indirect effect is not significant. And then we see that for the second indirect effect, the lower bound is negative 0.045, and the upper bound is negative 0.002. That confidence interval excludes zero, so this indirect effect is significant. It is recommended that for indirect effects you always report confidence intervals, because the confidence intervals don't have to be symmetric, and because the sampling distribution of indirect effects is often skewed, a symmetrical confidence interval can be biased. So, instead of using the standard errors and p-values to test indirect effects, it is recommended that you always report the bootstrapped confidence intervals. But the recent versions of APA style prescribe that you always report confidence intervals for all parameters anyway, so nowadays you should really be reporting confidence intervals for all of your parameters, not just for the indirect effects. Now I want to point out that bootstrapping is also very useful in other situations, particularly when the assumptions of multivariate normality are violated. Some people say bootstrap everything all the time because you can relax the assumption of normality. When we bootstrap, we only have one assumption, and that assumption is that our sample is representative of the population. Remember that the logic of the sampling distribution is that we could draw a thousand samples from the population, and that would give us a distribution of parameter estimates that we can use to perform inference. Bootstrapping approximates this sampling distribution by resampling our original data, but that logic only holds if our original data is a representative sample from the population. This is not a very strong assumption, however, because even if you use parametric statistics, there is an assumption that your sample is representative, otherwise the results will not generalize to the population. So we make fewer assumptions when we bootstrap than when we use parametric statistics. You have to be careful about one thing, however. A lot of authors write about bootstrapping as a small sample solution, because in small samples, the assumption of multivariate normality is usually violated. There are simply too few cases to have normally distributed residuals. But our colleagues Rens van der Schoot and Milica Miosevic recently published a book about small sample solutions in statistics, and one of the chapters addressed the question of whether bootstrapping is appropriate for small samples. As it turns out, bootstrapping is usually no better than parametric methods on small samples. So you should take this recommendation with a grain of salt. In other cases, bootstrapping can be a very useful tool, however, to deal with violations of multivariate normality.